Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Mary Beth West, Director of the Washington, D.C. Office of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the oldest and largest environmental organization in the world. Known for its endangered species Red List, IUCN functions as the world's authority on biodiversity and nature-based solutions. Mary Beth is an experienced international environmental lawyer who has been ambassador in the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs of the U.S. Department of State, and she has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Mary Beth, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So this organization is relatively unknown in the United States and very known internationally. Could you describe its, its genesis and, and its mission? Well, it's a, it's a very interesting organization. It was founded in 1948, so it's kind of a post-World War II organization. And it's unique in the sense that it is a union of both governments and non-governmental organizations. Um, it was founded basically to do sound science and science that would be credible because it is not just an uh, environmental advocacy organization, it also involves governments. Um, and then to use that science to influence policy, which is one of the reasons for having governments be, uh, be members. Um, it, it has grown over the years and uh, is, operates in about 60 countries all over the world. Um, the headquarters in, is in Switzerland, and we have regional offices all over the world. The office here in the United States is here really because the United States is such a, an important component um, when you're talking about environmental issues, and also because the big multilateral organizations are here, the World Bank, right. the Global Environment Facility, the Inter-American Development Bank, and, and others. And those are institutions with whom, with whom we work. And what's interesting to me about the structure of the organization, it seems to intentionally be composed of people that check each other, that balance each other out, so that you don't necessarily have one set of interests that predominate within, uh, as a voice of the group. The organization is comprised of three components. One is the staff, mm -hmm. and I'm a member of the staff. There are about a thousand members of the staff worldwide. The second component is the members, and the members, as I said, are both governments and non-governmental organizations. There are about 1,200 members worldwide. 1,000 staff, 1,200 members. members, and the members also have uh, considerable numbers of people attached Th to That's that. right. Some of the members are very large organizations like uh, the World Wildlife Fund and, and uh, Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy. Others are small organizations that uh, handle uh, cook stoves or small zoos and aquariums and, and things like that. And then the third component, um, which is, is in some ways the, the basis for a lot of our scientific work, is a series of six commissions which are comprised of experts. And these, these people are professors and government servants and just experts in various areas who have formed the commissions and they volunteer their time to us to help us do the scientific work. There are 12,000 members of those six commissions and um, located all over, the, all over the world. The largest commission is the Species Survival Commission which does our work, uh, for, uh, helps us with our work for the red list of, of threatened species. Uh, that, that commission has about 7,000 members. I believe 2,000 of them are, are here in the United States. And the, the expertise of these subject matter, matter experts is very deep, but also incredibly broad. That's, that's right. The, the Species Survival Commission, for instance, has all kinds of specialist groups. There's an amphibian specialist group and a tiger specialist group, and you, you name it. Uh, there's probably a specialist group uh, for it. And, and we, we rely on these experts a lot um, and on their volunteer work, actually, a lot as we do the scientific work that forms the basis for, for, our, for our knowledge products. Um, and so the, the, the challenge, really, is to, is to make sure that these three components are managed 
in a way that we all come together to work in the same direction on the same program. Describe those products and programs um, that um, are the material uh, outcomes of, of your uh, uh, work and your investments. Yeah. Well, let me, um, we are a democratic organization um, which creates its own issues. Um, and every four years, our members get together at a great big uh, meeting, which is called the World Conservation Congress. The last one was just held in Jeju, on Jeju Island, South Korea, in September of this year. Had about 8,000 people there. And our members um, basically develop and, and decide our program for the next four years. And our program for the next four years has, has three basic components. One of those is called valuing and conserving nature. Um, that includes our standard work on the red list and our species work and other things, and also includes the work we're doing on, on how you quantify the value of, of nature and biodiversity so that uh, both governments and the private sector can take those values into consideration. The second component of the program is called the effective and equitable governance of nature's use. And there we work on, with governments on their policies to, to make sure that, that the governance is appropriate and that women are involved, that there's gender, gender sensitivity and, and that those who, who live in nature are involved in the decisions about, about uh, how to conserve it. And the third, is deploying nature-based solutions to climate, food, and development. Um, so those are the three program areas. In those program areas, we, we do the scientific work. Um, we test things out on the ground through doing programs. And we, we either have or are developing a number of knowledge products. We are now developing, which I think is very exciting, a red list of ecosystems. So we're looking. So describe the the red, red list concept. We look at every. We're, we're trying to look at every species, right. and determine which are threatened or endangered, and we do that by working with the experts, by holding mm -hmm. workshops, if you will, in which we bring together the experts on those species from all over the world. Um, I have a group in my office that's as assessing some of the freshwater species in Latin America, mm -hmm. for instance. So we, they tend to work on certain groups of species at the same time. Um, the Red List of Ecosystems is just starting. Um, it is, was started um, by a member of one of our commissions who uh, is in Venezuela. And that will be, will look at threatened ecosystems. So it will be a broader concept than looking just at, at species. Now you're using research not only that is generated by yourself, but also by your members. We work with our members and use work that they have done, and also work with all of the members of these commissions who are, who are experts. And many of them, as I said, are professors, and, and so they are doing this work themselves with their universities and with their university colleagues, and they bring that work um, to, to us, and we rely on that along with other things in making these judgments. Do you find that the, uh, that the knowledge that is being shared from these diverse sources uh, accumulated by different people um, and different institutions, that this knowledge is viewed as being um, consistently um, accurate and therefore comparable, therefore shareable? Or is, uh, is this a group that, that periodically devolves into um, uh, wrestling matches over <laughs> which data to use and which data is most correct? Well, that's a very good question, and I, I really can't answer it because I don't sit in those, in those meetings. I, I am quite sure that when, when the workshops um, get together, that they do, they look at the data and assess the credibility of the various sources. How do you navigate uh, the, a terrain in which even the people who are part of your own consortium might have these, these differences? We try to navigate um, that, that landscape, if you will, in, in a way that, that looks at the conservation and sustainable use of nature. 
We are, we are not an organization that, uh, that wants to, to uh, stop use of nature. We, right. we, all, we all rely on nature. The, the food we eat, the air we breathe, everything is, is, comes from nature. And so what, what we want to do is find, a, find ways of living that, that conserve nature but allow us to, to sustainably use um, nature. Uh, in fact, the sustainability is basically our, our DNA, and we, we coined the, the phrase sustainable development uh, back in 1980 in our world conservation strategy. Um, so we sometimes do, because we have governments as members and, and NGOs, we sometimes do have to find that, that middle path, but it is, it is always a middle path that that looks at the ways in which we must use nature, but looks at ways in which we can try to conserve it as, as we use it. And also looks at ways that we can use nature equitably. So we take into consideration the human component, if you will, of, of equity in, in access to and use of nature. Now, you also um, belong to this massive organization. You are actually uh, the director of, of, a, uh, of a smaller office. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the role of the Washington, D.C. office. Uh, on the one hand, um, Washington, D.C. is the center of a lot of activity. Um, on the other hand, um, you probably have uh, a very practical operation uh, to, to, to manage here. Most of our regional offices around the world um, run their own programs. Right. We do not. The Washington office is really an, an outposted unit of headquarters. Oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't realize that you didn't actually run your own programs as well. We have programmatic people in our office, mm -hmm. but they work for the global programs that are run out of Switzerland. Oh, that's interesting. We don't really work here in the United States. We don't really have, have project okay. work on the ground here in the United States. With one exception, uh, which is related to the United States, we had... we. Have, have been heavily involved in some programs in my office that have to do with ecosystem-based management in the Arctic. As the Arctic opens, if you will, and as shipping begins, the idea is to try to look at how, how we can manage the shipping and the other uses of the Arctic that are going to begin. Um, those are not, that's not in the United States, but the United States is one of the Arctic countries. So. That, that is work that is highly related to the United States, and it's done in, in my office. So the office here, as I said uh, earlier, is, is really here because the United States is a very important member and because the, the, the World Bank, the Global Environment Facility, the Inter-American Development Bank, and many other organizations are, with whom we work mm -hmm. are here. We also host a number of, uh, of programs uh, which have decided that it's important for them to have people here in the United States. How does funding work for this organization? Um, we are, members pay dues. Mm -hmm. we do, the dues support about 10 percent of our budget. There are some governments who provide what we call framework contributions. They are they're consistent large donors beyond the membership dues. The United States has, has uh, generously provided um, consistent f uh, programmatic funding, funding, if you will, uh, and some of the European governments. But even those two sources of funds are, are less than 25 percent of, of, of our budget. Um, the rest of our budget comes from restricted funds for programmatic work, mm -hmm. um, funds from uh, government development organizations like USAID right. or, or uh, DANIDA um, or the NORAD in, 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 different, uh, in different governments. And then we, we do a little bit of, of just straight private fundraising, but really not, not very much. We're, we're, uh, we're early in that, in, in that game for, for us. So most of our funding at this point is, comes from foundations and development agencies for programmatic work. It's interesting to see how the um, private diplomacy um, ends up uh, uh, finding expression in different walks of life. In many respects, this organization is a manifestation of that type of private diplomacy. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, 
Yes, governments are involved, but it, it is really uh, a series of private organizations, uh, individuals, scientists, and so on and so forth, who have taken it upon themselves to work through a more neutral mm -hmm. uh, platform and use that as a way to communicate their findings, their research, and also gain access to the research of others. Right. One of the things we can do um, that, it, that because we are who we are, basically, is we can convene meetings that, that where we bring governments together with non-governmental organizations. And we also have a seat, for instance, a seat at the United Nations. We speak for nature at the United Nations. And we are permitted in certain United Nations meetings as, as observers and things. So, right. so we're able to assist our members, if you will, in, in getting a voice in some of these uh, national and international organizations. And we're able to convene uh, meetings as a credible, neutral uh, institution, basically. People, people regard us as kind of credible and neutral. And, and sometimes you want that kind of platform. Are there cross-cutting um, themes like global warming that, or, or like water utilization or, or, or you know, anything else that you see as dominating the dialogue that you will be fostering over the next mm -hmm. years? Well, we certainly do work on, on nature-based solutions to, to climate change. We have a, a big program um, in, in Asia and actually in other regions now uh, right. called Mangroves for the Future. Right. Mangroves are, are wonderful things. They, they are a carbon sink. They form a, a carbon sink, so they assist in mitigating uh, climate issues. Great habitat. Great habitat. They protect the coastline. Stabilize shores. Stabilize shores. And, and so that's an example of a, of a nature-based solution. So that, that is the kind of thing we, we look at. In, in, that's one of the things we look at in the climate arena. Now, in the recent meeting in Jeju, our members decided that we should put food security on our, on our list of priorities. Okay. This is not something we have worked on in the past much, but we, that now is one of our priority areas. And our niche in that, in that world, there are many organizations mm -hmm. working on food security as, yes. as we need to. Yes. But our niche in that is to look at the, at the intersection of uh, food and biodiversity. How can we use nature, if you will, to enable us to produce food more efficiently? And how can we ensure that the production of food does not harm the biodiversity around it? This is a fairly new area for us, but that, that is the kind of, of, of niche that we will play in, in the food security so arena. So what, what you are really trying to do is take a particular uh, approach to addressing these issues, to create the, uh, as you say, nature-based solutions, these solutions which, to use other terminology, which has grown quite popular, are sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and are you able to invest in these or, or channel the investment of your members into such solutions? Yes. Right. We, we try to work through our members mm -hmm. and work with our members. And, and so it, it, it may depend on the issue we're working on. We have certain members who are very active in climate, you know, doing right. climate work and, other mem and forests and things, and then other members who might be more active in, in food security. So. We, we would try to work with the members who are also working in those areas, particularly to test out on the ground theories about how nature can, can help us. And, and you are simultaneously working with others who are doing the same type of thing from their perspectives, yes. looking at where there's a coincidence of interest. And when you develop those projects, do those projects seek to engage uh, broad partnerships? Yes. Yes. And do you, do you pursue these projects with a uh, combined project team, with project managers, results? Do you have a standard for, for how you conduct these projects, or are they reinvented each time depending on the coalition that is formed? <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, I, we we have, have 
standards for the for the kinds of of systems we need right. for for projects and for and we are increasingly uh, ensuring standards for evaluating the success um, of projects. But I would imagine the actual manner in which projects are put together varies Just from region to region situation, and from type of, of project. In our regional offices in Latin America and in Asia, we, we tend to try to work through our members there um, because they there's a lot of small members on the ground and 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 uh, they are very important components of of those of those projects. And do you invest in any advocacy um, uh, of any type, political or otherwise? You mentioned the the I see that you had um, at the United Nations. Um, how does how does that function within the context of your organization? Well, we we don't think of ourselves as an advocacy organization or a political organization or a political organization. But nonetheless, one of our one of our core functions is to influence policy. Mm -hmm. So I, I suppose you can look at that in some ways as, and as influence ad policy advocacy. through the through your science through through our science. So the notion is we we do the science. We uh, begin to, to work on the knowledge products. We, some, we often test those out kind of on the ground through doing projects. And then we use those to try to influence uh, the way governments and, and the private sector basically approach, uh, approach certain activities that affect nature. We do have particularly um, particular relationships with several uh, private institutions institutions, several companies, if you will, mm -hmm. where we are working with them to um, reduce their impact on the environment and in, many, in some cases to try to make sure their impact is a positive impact rather than a negative impact. One of those is Rio Tinto, which is a big mm -hmm. mining company. Right. Um, one is Wholesome, which is a, a um, building products, uh, large, very large building products company in Europe. Uh, Nespresso. The mm -hmm. coffee uh, company and uh, Shell, Shell Oil. That's quite a range of you know from from sustainable uh, coffee harvesting to energy extraction uh, to, uh, to to uh, traditional mining. Mm -hmm. um, that's quite a range of different uh, types of organizations. It is, and I, I'm not. I don't have the the long history in in IUCN to tell you how those decisions were, were made, but I know those are the companies with which we have been working for the last several years since I've been here. Well, Mary Beth West, thank you so much for sharing the work of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, a fascinating consortium uh, and, and a, a truly unique model. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you very much for having me.